Good Wednesday evening to you, another beautiful day that the Lord uh, gave to us, and it's a particular blessing to be able to come together in the middle of the week and close out this day by spending some time together and uh, to encourage one another, and uh, so appreciate everybody's effort uh, in coming out tonight. We have a good group here in the auditorium, and I know uh, the teens are excited to be uh, with Pastor Andy and the entire families down there, and so we're thankful for all uh, that have been able to come out and to be a part of our uh, midweek meeting, and uh, it's so important for us to be uh, gathering and these days and just to keep each other encouraged and uh, even to pray together. What a, a vital ministry that the Lord has given to us as a church in terms of intercessory prayer. Uh, we alone uh, have that ability, and uh, God has just so much power, and he has given us the opportunity to be able to access that power through prayer, and uh, particularly as we meet together in prayer, uh, there's just so much strength and and involved in that and strength to be gained from that and so I so appreciate uh, those who have uh, joined here tonight and I know many are joining us online and want to say a huge thank you to you for taking 
uh, the time to do that this evening as well, and uh, it's very important, again, even for those that are not able to actually physically be here to still stay connected and be a part of the Bible study, and I know you'll take some time to pray in your homes afterwards as well, and uh, it's just a, just a great opportunity that we have here uh, tonight. So let me just um, remind us of a few things that are uh, coming up uh, before we get going into our Bible study tonight, uh, just uh, this coming uh, Sunday, all of our Sunday school ministries will be online, so that's our adult Sunday school uh, with Josh as he continues through First Peter chapter 3, and uh, that'll be online uh, sometime on Sunday morning, and then as well uh, for our kids' ministry, Pastor Andy and Sarah and uh, the puppets, whoever that happens to be, uh, will be involved in that as well, uh, so there will be, that'll be released uh, early Sunday morning as well, and uh, there should be opportunities for folks to be able to watch Sunday school online and still get here for those that are designated to come to our Sunday morning service. I think uh, this coming Sunday uh, for our morning service, we have uh, groups five through eight uh, who are here at the building. And uh, so, that, and to subdivide that, groups seven and eight are here in the auditorium, and then groups five and six down in the fellowship hall. And uh, then in the evening service, uh, everybody on the west side of the bridge will be here. And so that's groups three and four here in the auditorium, and then groups one and two in the fellowship hall. And uh, it's hard to keep all these things straight, so if you don't know when you're designated to come, just come, and uh, we'll find somewhere for you to go. And um, we've kind of underestimated with our groups a little bit to allow uh, for if visitors do come or those that need the hearing assist or those that don't have uh, online uh, capabilities uh, to be able to come and still be a part uh, of our group here in the auditorium. And so that's uh, this Sunday, and then uh, next Wednesday, uh, the same uh, setup as we've got tonight. And then I uh, just wanted to just keep you to know about our prayer partners. Uh, we are going to try to get that prayer partner ministry going uh, the 1st of February. A really great opportunity just to connect with someone throughout the year and uh, just uh, intercede uh, for them. And uh, so uh, there are sign-up sheets still there on the welcome desk. And again, we're going to try to get the pairings together by uh, the 1st of February. So be advised about that. And uh, then this weekend, as I mentioned this past Sunday, uh, we are going to start the nomination pro process for the various church offices, and so there will be an email sent out uh, Friday afternoon uh, with information about that. Then those who are here on Sunday, uh, there will be nomination uh, ballots that will be available at the welcome desk this coming Sunday. And so um, just got to be praying about that, and the reason we're getting started with that a little bit earlier is our annual meeting is currently set for March 24th. Uh, but just with the uncertainty of the times, uh, we just thought we'd get the nomination process going and uh, kind of get that on, on the go so that will be uh, taken care of so that if we do need to bump our meeting up a little bit earlier in March, if uh, the circumstances would uh, dictate that we would need to do that, uh, that we'll uh, be ready uh, to do that. And so just be advised about those things. And um, yeah, several prayer requests that we'll share a little bit later on in our time. But why don't we uh, just take a moment to just open our evening in prayer here and uh, just dedicate this time to the Lord, and then we'll begin our Bible study in Colossians 3. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, it's good uh, to be uh, called your children. Uh, we know that it is only uh, by your grace that we can do that, and to know that as your children we can cry out, Abba, Father, uh, knowing that uh, you are hearing our requests, uh, you desire to answer our, our requests, you desire to lift our burdens, and uh, you have the power uh, to be able to answer uh, the requests that we make, and uh, Lord, as we have seen time and time again, as we have cried out to you, you have shown yourself to be strong, and we trust that that's going to happen again even tonight as we meet as your church and pray together. Uh, we trust that you will hear and uh, you will answer and uh, that you will work in such a way as to bring glory to yourself and using our prayers in that process. What a wonderful thing that this is. I'm thankful for the life that you have given to us in your son, the life that drives us to come out as your church, whether we're here in person or just even joining at home, uh, to desire to be a part of this. We can only say glory to God uh, for the desire that you've put in our hearts to do this. And we trust, Lord, that everything that we do tonight would be an offering of praise uh, to you and that you would be pleased with our worship and our prayer tonight. And even as we take time in, in the Word this evening, we do ask, Lord, just for uh, clarity uh, in my communication and clarity in all of our understanding of your Word uh, that it might prove to be life-giving, and uh, that it would truly uh, correct our thinking, that it would conform us to the image of Christ, and may this be a, just a profitable time in which we'd be edified in your word, and then in our fellowship with one another, and then even in our prayer time. And again, we desire for you to receive the glory in all that we do throughout this evening. It's in Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen. 
All right, well, I would invite you to uh, turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3 uh, tonight. Um, I was reflecting a bit this morning on where we have been in our study on heaven, and uh, we began some three months ago uh, recalling the origins of heaven, uh, that heaven is God's idea. Uh, he created it. Then we considered how it, it is that Satan used to live there until God evicted him along with a third of the angels uh, because of Satan's pride in exalting himself. And then we spent the night to consider the location of heaven, and we said that it's up, way up, and then we spent several weeks contemplating the temporary or intermediate heaven, the paradise of God where our loved ones and the Lord exist today, uh, where all believers until the end times events will be going, and uh, after which God will create a new heaven and a new earth. And then uh, the last couple of weeks we conducted some studies on angels and gave some thought to what our relationship with angels is here on the earth now, and also contemplated some of what our relationship with angels will be throughout eternity future, that we as the redeemed saints and the angels who have observed everything that God has done since day one of creation as we come together and worship around the throne forever and ever. In coming weeks, I plan to move into some discussions about the new heaven and the new earth, uh, the new Jerusalem, our final destination as it's talked about in great detail in Revelation 21 and 22. That's going to be an exciting study once we get there. And then from there, I'd really like for us to even walk through uh, the whole end times strategy and to see all of the things that will be taking place uh, both on the earth and in heaven leading up to the end times. I think we've all been giving thought in recent days to the fact that it seems that the return of the Lord is really soon. And I think it'd be good for us to get uh, up to speed on what the Bible says that we can expect in the last days, and I'm really looking forward to getting into that kind of in conjunction with our study on heaven a little bit later on in the winter. But I wanted to take tonight, uh, midway through our study on heaven, to consider this passage that really challenges us to do what we have been doing as a church on these Wednesday nights, and that is to think much and to think often on heaven and our eternal destiny. Colossians 3 is the passage that really motivated me to study heaven in the first place, and I thought tonight would be a great night for us to walk through it together. Originally intended to do it last week, but some other things took place last week that uh, are leading us to do it tonight instead. But let's go ahead and start by reading Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 together. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now, I want to start with a puzzle for you. A couple of years ago, I was uh, driving in the north end on the way to the hospital for a visit when I stopped uh, at a red light and I came up behind this vehicle. And my attention was arrested because it was a van, and it was a Kia van, which we have. But as I hit the brakes behind this van, I noticed this license plate. And it took me a while to figure out what it said. But once I did, I had to snap a picture. Can you solve the puzzle? Heaven can wait. H-V-N-C-N-W-8. Heaven can wait. Now, initially... When I came up on this guy, it struck me as rather funny, because I could appreciate a license plate like this if the guy was driving a Corvette or a Mustang or even a nice new pickup truck, but he was driving a minivan, an IKEA minivan. Apparently, this individual, and you may have seen him around town as well, I've seen it a few times actually, thinks that driving a Kia minivan, and one that's covered in road salt nonetheless, he would rather be doing that than walking the streets of gold in heaven. And after I got over the hilariousness of this whole thing, it then struck me how sad it really is. Because this is frankly how most of the world lives. Just consumed with earthly pleasures and comforts, chasing after earthly dreams, getting the most out of whatever this life can offer. But heaven, if there even is a heaven, 
Well, heaven, that can wait. And sadly for most people, for those who die without Christ, really what they have on earth is the best that they will ever know. And it's rather tragic, isn't it? Colossians 3 is written to us as believers to lift our gaze from the trinkets and the treasures of this temporary life and to take our minds and our affections off of things on this earth and to place them firmly and continually on things above and things that are ahead of us. There are two commands given in verses 1 to 4 of Colossians chapter 3. What are the two commands? If you were to find the two imperatives in verses 1 and 2 there, what are they? This is question number one on your handout, if you're following on the handout. Seek and set. Those are the two words that are given to us in the form of a command. He says, seek and set your affection. And the object of our seeking and the object of our setting our affection is on the same thing, right? What does it say? Things above. Seek things above, set your affections on things above. Not on things around us, not things below us, not things even inside of us, but rather things that are above us. Now, the word seek in verse 1 is self-explanatory. It really speaks to our, our values. For the believer, God's things are to come first. Our allegiance to him trumps every other earthly allegiance. When faced with choices, the first factor in the choices that I make is not What will this do for me here on the earth? How will this make me more comfortable? But rather it is, will God be pleased with this decision? What kind of eternal treasures will I be laying up if I make this decision? And and what does it, how does this impact my eternity? How will this help grow God's kingdom? The things of God, eternal things, are to consume the believer's thinking. And Jesus said this, In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 6 and verse 33, when he said, Seek first, what? The kingdom of heaven. Seek seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now that second term, the term set, and combined with the rest of the phrase, set your affections, this term has the idea of setting your mind. It literally is mind things above. Think on things that are above. But the translation affection there really is excellent because we naturally think on the things that bring us pleasure, don't we? I don't know about you, those of you who did grow up in a church setting, which I did. There was a battle for me constantly as a child when I was in church and I was supposed to be listening to the message. And my mind would often wander. And it doesn't just something that happens to kids. It's something that happens to adults as well. None of you, of course, but many adults this will happen to. But you're there, and you know you're supposed to be listening to the message, but your mind is wandering to things that are actually a lot less important than the truths that the preacher is preaching about. So for me, it was sports, thinking a lot about what I would do the next day and the the big game that I had lined up the next day, or maybe you're thinking about a particular boy or a particular girl or a relationship or whatever it happens to be, and our minds are constantly wandering from things above to things that are on the earth. And so what we think about, though, really shows what it is that we have an affection for. And uh, this is absolutely true. And so we're called in verse 1 to set our minds on things above, to value things above, so much that we would seek them. But then in verse 2, to actually treasure the things that are above, so much that we mind them over earthly things. And both of these terms are given in a tense that really indicates that this is something that we ought to be constantly doing. In other words, we're going to constantly be drifting back to things that are below. And we're constantly called as believers to put our minds back on things that are above. We see an advertisement and we get consumed by some product and suddenly we just got to have it. A friend gets a new truck and suddenly the old hatchback has lost its luster. That family just seems to have all of their things in order. And my family is such a mess and we tend to envy those that have it all together. That woman seems to have the perfect husband. That man seems to have the perfect wife. An image pops up on the screen, and so quickly we're driven to things and to mind things that are on the earth. Or on the other hand, things that are not so pleasurable, but things that are disappointing and frustrating, we're constantly driven to think about those things as well. 
when we move back into orange level again, what a frustrating thing. When our sports team loses, when we get a diagnosis that is less than desirable, and on and on we could go, when the house is falling apart, and over and over we seek and we set our minds on things that are around us and things that are below. It happens all day, every day, and the Scripture calls us constantly to lift our thoughts and our affections back upward. Do this every day, constantly. It's a constant refocus that we are called to do here. Now, number two, what are the things above? Or where are the things above, I should say? What does the end of verse 1 say? Seek those things which are above, okay, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Where is Christ seated at God's right hand? It's not a hard question. It's in heaven, okay? And what direction did we say heaven is? It's up, it's above. So we're called to look up and to value and to have an affection for and think about and long for heaven. To constantly lift our gaze from the things of the earth that are passing away, things like Kia minivans and viruses and other things like that, and to long for a better world. This is good for us. Heaven is to be a place that we think about often. It's a place that we ought to be regularly longing for. And I wanted to consider this third question as sort of a discussion point and maybe to help stir up some affections that towards our longing for heaven, but who are some people that have had this kind of upward view, this kind of longing for heaven? And we'll start with people in the Bible. Who are some scriptural examples that you know of, people that longed for things above and lived in that way? Okay, Stephen is a great example of that, who as he is being stoned to death, he immediately looks upward to heaven and he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Who else? Okay, Paul, he says, well, do you tell me, what does he say? Where's a couple of places where he expresses his longing for heaven? Outside of here, Colossians 3, obviously, but where else? Okay, absent for the body, present with the Lord. I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, okay? For me to live as Christ, to die as gain. Who else? What's that? Enoch, another example. of One who lived for heaven and who was taken up to heaven in a very unique way. Okay, Abraham. In fact, speaking of Abraham, let's flip over to Hebrews for just a minute because this comes up a lot in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And you can give other examples other than what we have in Hebrews 11, but Hebrews 11 records some of the upward gaze of the Old Testament saints in particular. And if you look down at um, verses 9 and 10, notice what it says there. Hebrews 11 verses 9 and 10, this is talking about Abraham. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So Abraham is driven by this better country that he has to look forward to. Who else in Hebrews 11? Coming up just a little bit down the road in Hebrews 11, who else has talked about there? Okay. Yeah. Moses is an incredible example of this, down in verses 23 through 26, where it says that he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Okay? Um, There are others. Now, just generally, it's in, if you look back in verse 13 in Hebrews 11, it says, In verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they'd been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had an opportunity to have returned, but now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And so, 
Hebrews 11 says you got Moses, you got Abraham, but just generally speaking, what drove the Old Testament saints to keep on going with what they were dealing with is that they had this heavenly country to look forward to. You know that even Jesus himself was motivated by an upward gaze on heaven to endure all that he endured? And this comes up in the next chapter in Hebrews chapter 12. As long as we're there, look at verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Even Jesus longed for heaven. He sought things above. His affections were set firmly on things above, and that motivated him. That caused him to endure all of the suffering that he went through, knowing that it was going to end, and that he had this eternal glory to look forward to. And he knew he was going to get there. And the same of us is true of us today. How about even beyond the Bible? You think of maybe examples in church history, or maybe even saints that have discipled you, or that you have looked up to over the years, that you just looked at their life, and they, these are people that lived with an upward focus. What's that? Say it again. Ed McNeil. Absolutely. <laughs> That's a great example. Exactly. I would say that he definitely lived with that. Yeah, Zach. Okay. Perry F. Rockwood. Someone that Zach saw living that kind of life. Okay, Ellen Wark. It's interesting to think about some of these who have lived this way, and this has been, you know, we've experienced people like this that have lived in among us, people that we have looked up to, but all throughout church history, all throughout Bible times, people have been setting their affections on things above, and they have been driven to endure through things of this life because of what awaits them. I'm just going to read one quote from a church father, the Cyprian, who said, let us greet the day which assigns each of us to his own home, which snatches us from this place and sets us free from the snares of the world and restores us to paradise and the kingdom. Anyone who has been in foreign lands longs to return to his own native land. We regard paradise as our native land. And it's true, isn't it? We have this saying, there's no place like what? Like home, okay? And it's probably a, a strange time to be saying something like that because some of us are sick of being home and we would like to go on a trip and to go somewhere else. But if you have ever gone on a trip and you've been gone for a long period of time, at some point on your journey, you end up saying something like that, don't you? I just can't wait to get back home. I just can't wait to get back into my own bed and to be around things that are familiar. We long for home. And for us as believers, we are just pilgrims here on the earth. Our home is actually in heaven. And it ought to be our cry, our heartbeat, to really think this way, that there really is no place like home, and we long to be there. Now, on what basis can we do that? Question number four. According to Colossians 3 and verse 1, what historical event enables us and motivates to anticipate heaven? Okay, the resurrection, right? What does he say? If you then be risen... Okay, I've got to get back to Colossians 3 myself here. I was in Hebrews. Colossians chapter 3, If ye then be risen with Christ, then seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now, we get a lot of bad news these days. But let's not forget the very best news that has ever been delivered. Jesus Christ has conquered death. He is risen from the grave. He has conquered the greatest enemy that we have ever faced, and that's death itself. And where is he now? What does it say at the end of verse 1? He's seated at the right hand of God. This is the highest, most privileged place in all of the creation. Jesus is there, and from that place he will come again, and he will rule. Is that good news? Uh, Psalm 110 in verse 1, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until what? Until I make thine enemies your footstool. That's going to happen. Christ has already died to pay for sin. He has already risen from the grave. He has been already elevated to the place of privilege and power. 
And he is soon going to come back and subdue all of his enemies. And by faith, we're in on all of that as believers. We're on his side. And all of that is the basis for these commands to look up. Because through Christ, we're actually already there. We are already seated in the heavenlies. We are already risen with him. Notice at the, uh, how verse 1 starts. It says, if ye then be risen with Christ. But it, the idea there really is, since ye then have been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. The word actually means, when it says you've been risen with Christ, the idea is you have been co-resurrected with Christ. Now let me ask you something. Have any of you risen from the dead yet? It's not a hard question. It's not a trick question. No, none of you have risen from the dead. Has the resurrection happened yet for you? When is the resurrection going to happen for you? At the rapture. And yet Paul speaks of this resurrection of believers as already having happened. Now, why do you suppose he does that? Question number five. Why does Paul speak of our resurrection as something that has already even occurred? He does so because it's as good as done. Our resurrection is so sure that Paul can say, since you have been risen with Christ, it is so sure that it will happen that Paul can already speak of it in the past tense. Because Christ himself has already been resurrected. That's a fact. Christ has already been raised to the right hand of God. And what does that mean for you and I who are in Christ? We're going to be raised too. We look back at uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. Here's what it says. If you look at Colossians 1 and verse 18, speaking of Christ, there it says that he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That is the first one to ever be raised from the dead, never to die again. And he is the pattern for all of us who are in him. If Christ himself has risen, we too will rise. He is our pattern. When he died, we died with him. And when he rose, we rose with him. Do you see that? Turn over to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 for just a moment. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, a well-known passage. It's just a few pages before Colossians 3. Keep your finger in Colossians 3 because we'll be right back. But could I get someone actually to read Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20? Somebody may be able to even quote this. Go ahead. What's that saying? When Christ died, there's a sense in which I was involved in that. That I died to sin when Christ was crucified. Nevertheless, Paul says, I live. Why? Because Christ lives. Just as I died with him in his crucifixion, I have been raised with him in his resurrection. I'll go back to Colossians 2. Back into Colossians chapter 2. And notice how it is phrased here in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13, when it says, And you, being dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he hath quickened together with him, having forgiven you all of your trespasses. In other words, we were once spiritually dead, but by his dead and by his resurrection life, he gave us life. And that life he gives never goes away. One day we're going to rise. And it is so certain that this resurrection will happen, it's as if it already did happen. I remember years ago, uh, when I was playing on a hockey team in college, and we showed up at our opponent's campus. And when we got there, there were signs posted all over the campus that said these words. I'll never forget it. It says, we guarantee victory. And they were placing these posters all over their campus to try to motivate their fans to come out and to watch the game. Now, we slaughtered that team in their own field. It was fantastic, in their own barn. It was awesome. I will never forget it. But I remember just that feeling of satisfaction, particularly because they guaranteed that they would be victorious over us, and we wiped them out. But often that is the case. People brag and they boast about things that they think will happen, and they even visualize it as happening, and they even guarantee that it will happen, but they can't come through. This happens in the sports world, it happens in politics all the time. 
Listen, for those of us who are in Christ, the victory that is promised to us, it's going to happen. It's as good as done. Ephesians, again, says you are already seated in the heavenlies. It's all yours. We've already left this earthly life with all of its pleasures and with all of its frustrations, and we have moved to a new domain where Christ already lives. Notice how this plays out back in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3 when he says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, you're already there, but it's kind of mysterious. He says that it's hid with Christ in God. In other words, you are locked in with Christ. You are in union with him forever by grace through faith. And and we need to work hard to see ourselves there instead of here because our pattern is already there. We're we're hidden there. And that means that we're secure, but it's also there's some mystery to it. I love how the hymn writer put it. He said, Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am the King of glory and of grace, one with himself. I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. We're already there. So think about it. Paul says, long for it. Set your affection, set your thinking on this. Look up. Don't look down. I used to go uh, rock repelling and climbing years ago when I first started doing that. My instructor would get me all tied up, and I would just start walking backwards, you know, towards the edge of the cliff, and everything in you is screaming at you, saying, don't do this. You're not supposed to back up off the edge of a cliff. Cliff, And then the instructor would say something like, don't look down, because if you look down, it's going to be kind of disheartening, and you're not going to trust the rope. He'd say, rather, trust the rope, trust your instructor. And eventually, you would just go ahead and do it, and you had a fantastic time. But it's going to be disheartening for us as believers if we look down and we see the chaos all around us and we focus on all of the, even the joys that are taking place around us. But if we are looking down and on the things of this earth, we will be disappointed, we'll be frustrated. But if we look up, we're going to have hope, we're going to have confidence, we're going to make it because our future is secure. And this is how we live out the gospel. On a day-to-day basis, we're learning to think right that we might do right. Through Christ's death, we have died to sin. Through his resurrection, we live to righteousness. So we set our affections on things above and not on the things of this earth that are passing away. So much more could be said about that. And Paul goes on. You might read this on your own. If you start reading in verses 5 and on, he goes all through this list of sins that you need to actively be putting off as people that are setting their affections on things above and not on things of the earth. But in closing, what is the main attraction in all of this? Why are we called to seek things above? Why should we set our minds and affections on things that are above us rather than things that are below us? What is the main attraction, question number six? What is it that we are ultimately anticipating? Pastor Bart? That's right. It's where our citizenship is. It's our home. It's where we belong. But who's there? It's Christ, right? How many times does the name Christ appear in these four verses? Go ahead and look at it and count it. How many times in those four verses do you see the term, the name Christ? Four times. And every time it emphasizes some aspect of his work. At the beginning of verse 1, when you see Christ there, what's emphasized there is that he is risen. If you then be risen with Christ. At the end of verse 1, where the name Christ is used again, what's emphasized there? His ascension. He's at the raised to the right hand of the throne of God. In verse 3, when it's used again, what is emphasized? Our life is hid with Christ in God. That is, we are seated in the heavenlies with him. This is our conversion. The glorious day when by faith we were united to him, all of these realities became ours. How about verse 4? What's mentioned there? What aspect of Christ's work is there? When Christ, who is our life, shall appear. What's that talking about? The second coming. (laughs) This is when he comes again. Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So when that happens, when the second coming happens, all that we experience by faith today will become a full reality for us. All of our longings will be fulfilled. We will appear with him, it says, in glory. 
He's already your life now. But too often we fail to see him because we're looking down. But when he appears, there will be no escape. There will be or no mistake whatsoever. We will appear with him, and there will never be any mistaking of who we are. There will be absolutely no doubt. I love what one commentator said about this. He said, the veil which now shrouds your higher life from others, and even partly from yourselves, it'll be withdrawn. The world which persecutes, despises, and ignores believers now will then be blinded with the dazzling glory of the revelation. Let me wrap up with a song that I just wanted to read to you. We don't sing this one very often, probably because it has a bit of a dark, sort of sad tune, a funeralish sounding tune, I suppose. We generally prefer happier sounding songs than this one. But it's in our living hymns. It's the song, The Sands of Time Are Sinking. Does anybody know this song? Who knows The Sands of Time Are Sinking? All right, it's 779B in the living hymnal. Now, 779A is the Star Spangled Banner, okay? We don't need to sing that one, especially these days. But let me just read the lyrics to you from 779B, okay? Listen to this. The sands of time are sinking. The dawn of heaven breaks. The summer morn I've sighed for, the fair sweet morn awakes. Dark, dark hath been the midnight, but day spring is at hand, and glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. On Christ, O Christ, he is the fountain, the deep sweet well of love. The streams on earth I've tasted, more deep I'll drink above. There to an ocean fullness, his mercy doth expand, and glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. With mercy and with judgment, my web of time he wove, and a the dews of sorrow were lustered with his love. I'll bless the hand that guided, I'll bless the heart that planned, when throned where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. Oh, I am my beloved's, and my beloved's mine. He brings a poor, vile sinner into his house of wine. I stand upon his merit. I know no other stand, not even where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. The bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze at glory, but on my king of grace. Not at the crown he giveth, but on his pierced hand. The lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. Now, there's a lot of people out there, and I think a lot of Christians even, who think that heaven can wait. But I, for one, can't wait for heaven, and I trust that you do. But until we get there, because we know that we will get there, let's seek things that are above. Let's mind things that are above and set our affections on things that are above us rather than on the things of this earth that are passing away. And one of the ways that we do that is by doing what we plan to do together tonight, and that is by praying. And we want to take time to do that next to our online family, let me just encourage you to take some time to pray there in your homes. Certainly lots to pray about these days. Just generally, I'll share a few things with even our online uh, audience, things that you might want to keep in mind. I would encourage you to pray for the health of our church family. We do have a couple who are still recovering from surgeries and uh, one who is still facing chemo. Please pray for them. Uh, pray for our missionaries. Uh, they are all going through challenging times in their specific context and Pray specifically for South Africa. Uh, I was in touch with uh, the Hasmans and uh, heard from the Hunters as well that they have been put back into lockdown level three, which means churches can't meet at all. And uh, this is a very frustrating situation for our missionaries, the uh, Rudolphs and the Hunters and the Hasmans. So you might pray for them. And of course, pray for peace uh, south of the border. Uh, there's no telling how that's all going to end. We have no idea, but we know. Uh, we need the Lord to intervene there and to bring peace, and so pray for that. And uh, then pray for the, the latest spike in cases uh, here uh, around the province, and uh, just pray that the Lord will preserve life and uh, just give wisdom and strength to our leaders and uh, also a platform for us as the church to just uh, share the gospel with people who are hurting and in need of the hope that we all have lying in one of us. And so we're going to sign off at this time and take some time to pray here in the auditorium and we'd urge you to pray about those things as well in your own homes. Have a good night.